uh, speaker for today, as uh, he is somewhat local to myself. Andrew Eddins, a fellow IBMer who is uh, a research physicist, is uh, joining us today to talk about doubling the size of quantum simulators by entanglement forging. He, uh, before joining IBM, was uh, working on his PhD with uh, Professor Siddiqui at the University of California, Berkeley, where he was uh, doing research on the interaction between squeeze states and superconducting qubits. Uh, after joining IBM, he had started working on qubit coherence and measurement, uh, but then joined the quantum demonstrations team, which he is currently uh, a member of. And as I understand it, where a lot of the work you will be uh, talking on today is from. So again, uh, and everyone, please join me in welcoming Andrew Eddins, our speaker for today. Great. Th thank you, Thomas. Thank you for the introduction. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Um, it's really cool to be uh, broadcasting to everyone around the world. Um, okay. So I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and, and jump in then. Um, Feel free. So uh, yeah, so the topic of this talk is uh, some work on we've done on uh, using classical computing resources to uh, expand the, the size of problem that we can attack with a given quantum simulator or quantum chip. Um, and, and the pro procedure we're, we've uh, the name we've given to our uh, our procedure is, is called classically forged entanglement or entanglement forging. Uh, and so the work that I'll be discussing and the results are, are a product of um, significant contributions from all the all the folks listed here on this slide, uh, which comprise a collaboration across both the San Jose, California, and the Yorktown Heights, New York, uh, IBM Research Centers. And uh, if you'd like more details on this work, you can check it out on archive at this uh, archive listing here. Right. So. It's so, a quick motivation. You know, there's been a lot of great progress recently using quantum processors, quantum hardware to simulate increasingly complex systems. You know, looking at uh, chemical simulations and, and, so, and related problems is certainly a big motivator for at least near term and, and even far term uh, applications of quantum uh, computing technologies. Um, the moment, I'd say by and large, it's still not really competitive with the mature classical simulation technologies that have been developed over over the decades. Um, so, so a compelling question now is how can we kind of best apply our current relative wealth of classical computing resources to extend the reach of existing limited quantum processors? And so uh, one, one theme in this line of inquiry is uh, this, this idea of taking a, a large quantum circuit, so some large you know, experiment that you'd like to run on a processor, but that might be difficult on, for that processor to perform with high fidelity or, or might just have too many qubits to fit on the processor. And uh, finding a way to replace this with a distribution of smaller circuits that you can execute on smaller processors or, or with higher fidelity on a given processor, uh, the results of which can be summed over and are, are process, classically processed in some way uh, to reconstruct the result of, of the desired original circuit. Um, so here are a few uh, a, a little more context on this, a, a few uh, prior works uh, in this direction. It's really kind of scratching the surface of the, the different ways that people are exploring of using classical computation to augment quantum capabilities. Uh, there's this work by Bravi et al. in 2016, looking at generally the exchange of quantum resource requirements for classical resource requirements. Um, and some, some other works, uh, select works shown here on using classical resources to essentially cut either a wire or, or a gate within a, a large quantum circuit, replacing it with a, a distribution of smaller pieces that can be summed over in some way to reconstruct uh, the, the original, uh, the behavior of the original object. Um, and, and broadly, these sorts of techniques can benefit when you can find a way to, to chop up your problem into pieces that are only uh, weakly interacting uh, subsystems. Which you can then, and that tends to lower the uh, cost of reconstructing the quantum correlations using classical processing. So, in this work today, uh, we'll present a method, entanglement forging, for generally decomposing a, a two n qubit problem uh, into pieces that can be run on an n qubit quantum computer. 
so having the number of qubits. Uh, and um, it seems that you can efficiently run this process uh, provided the two halves are, are weakly entangled, as we'll see. So here's a quick outline of the, the talk, roughly a theory and experiment section where the theory I'll talk about entanglement forging, uh, the procedure and, and entanglement uh, sort of more generally, his background, um, and also his background, uh, we talk about how you can simulate a molecule. In this case, we'll be focusing on the, the water molecule, H2O, uh, with a more conventional uh, application of the variational quantum eigensolver, VQE, uh, without entanglement forging. And then we'll combine these two elements and the, discussing our experimental results, uh, running a five qubit, using five physical qubits to simulate essentially a 10 qubit problem uh, where we're using entanglement forging to um, run VQE on, uh, uh, run VQE on this uh, water simulation. So getting into um, the discussion of entanglement here, it's a bit of background. So entanglement can be described in a number of different ways. Um, one nice way of uh, discussing it is in terms of its Schmidt coefficients, which you can represent as lambda sub n here. So say we have some two uh, register state, we can initialize it as uh, you know sort of n capital N qubits in the ground state in the first register, capital N qubits in the ground state in the second register. We're applying some uh, gate E that's going to generate entanglement between them, generating some uh, general state psi. Um, and we can write the state psi as, as uh, in terms of its Schmidt decomposition shown here. So it's this uh, summation or summing over some set of basis states. Uh, I'm assuming people can see my cursor, but maybe it's helpful if they turn on the laser pointer. Um, summing over a set of uh, basis states uh, weighted by the Schmidt coefficients lambda sub n. Um, so we can get a bit of intuition uh, that starts to show why these might be useful. Um, thinking about some limiting cases, if in the case where the state is not entangled, um, then we're talking about a product state. So we could write psi as just a single term within this summation. So that means that lambda sub, lambda sub 1, say, is equal to 1, and all the other terms are 0. So plotting that, it looks like this on the left. Um, for a not entangled state, we just have a product state. It's kind of a maximally concentrated uh, distribution of uh, Schmidt coefficients, or, or max maximally peaked. Um, in contrast, in the other limiting case, the system is maximally entangled. Um, all of the Schmidt coefficients are equal, so we're kind of as far from this case as we can be. Uh, because psi, of course, is normalized, that, and there are uh, two to the end of these terms, that means that uh, each of those terms is going to take on the value of one over square root of two to the n. So if we have a, a maximum entangled state, this is just totally flat. And then, of course, we can uh, be somewhere in between as well in, for, for a general state. Um, so the intuition is stronger entanglement means we have sort of a, a more uniform, flatter distribution of these Schmidt coefficients. And sometimes for brevity, I'll just call them Schmitts. So um, a nice property about these states that's going to make them useful for us uh, is that they're, uh, they, they really care about the correlation between the two registers, the entanglement, but not really about the local states themselves. So in particular, if we're generating the state psi by applying uh, this gate E, defining, it defines the set of Schmidt coefficients, we can then apply further local operations on either of the two registers independently that's going to rotate these basis vectors inside of these terms into one another, but it's not going to change the coefficients out front. So they're really invariant to further local unitary operations. Um, so that's kind of going to that kind of suggests a, a rough division of labor, um, where maybe we can apply uh, u and v as as smaller operations, or smaller uh, number of qubits, um, on something like the the basis states in these summations, take those measurement results and feed them into a classical computer that can combine them with some list of list of parameters, the Schmidt coefficients, um, in order to commute, compute the sum, whatever summation we need uh, to compute, say, some expectation value of interest for the state psi. Um, so that's sort of a very high level picture. We can try to get a little more uh, concrete uh, thinking about some of the math here of, of what, going through mathematically, what n qubit circuits do we need to execute to let us uh, measure, say, an expectation value of some operator O. And um, 
here we'll, we'll say that operator out can be written as a tensor product of operators that act on the two, uh, the two registers ind independently, um, which is uh, not a crazy assumption given that a lot of the Hamiltonians will be interested in uh, can be written as uh, written in terms of operators of this form. Um, so, okay, we're starting with the state psi and write it in terms of the Schmidt, de Schmidt decomposition here. We want the expectation value, so we'll be sandwiching O between a copy of psi on the right, a copy of psi on the left. Each of those comes with its own capital sigma, so we'll have some double sum over the set of basis states. Um, some of those basis states will, will meet themselves as they go through the sum. Some of them will meet other basis states, so we'll have some, some diagonal terms and some cross terms. Um, it's not immediately obvious how to process that, if you, uh, but uh, essentially we'll be using this algebraic trick that's, that's schematically shown in this blue stripe here. Um, this is sort of looking at a minimal case. If we just had you know, two qubits, say these correspond to uh, the two registers, let's say being in uh, one, uh, one basis state um, plus both registers being in, in a, a, different regist a, a different basis state. So you know, B sub N and B sub M. Um, so this is some entangled, you know, entangled state, Bell state. If we want the expectation value of this, uh, it turns out we can rewrite this quantity as a summation over a classical mixture of single register superposition, uh, superposition states uh, m multiplied together. So we'll sum over you know, expectation value when both registers are in one of the basis states, when both registers are in the other basis state, uh, and then we'll additionally measure, uh, we'll additionally prepare some superposition states. You know, B, B sub n plus or minus B sub m really are the ones that we'll care about. Um, and, and by measuring additionally those expectation values and including them in the summation, we'll be able to reconstruct the statistics that describe this, this entangled state of interest. Uh, so a little more mathematically, this is shown here, expectation value of O can be written in terms of these n qubit circuits. Here we're preparing these basis states uh, corresponding to terms in our Schmidt, Schmidt decomposition and measuring operators one, operator two, um, have additionally absorbed these U and B unitaries into this uh, into the tilde here above the operators. Um, and then additionally, there are these superposition states. Um, I won't worry about defining this, but it's, it's, the, it's the sum or difference of, of uh, pairs of these basis states. Um, so we've now written this expectation value in terms of circuits that we can, or expectations that we can measure on with, with half as many qubits, provided we can prepare these states. Uh, a question, Andrew, from the audience mm -hmm. from Harsh Deep asking, but wouldn't the entangled states affect each other's measurements? Is there a particular criteria for such operators? Um, so, for the operator we're interested in, I would say we should be able to write it as a tensor product like this. Um, as far as the entangled states, yes, if we're, yeah, that's that's sort of the, the surprising thing, at least to me, is that um, a, you'd think because the the two registers are entangled, um, you'd have this uh, the statistical correlations between the two, such that you know if you measure. The first cube, uh, the first uh, register being in one basis state, the second register will always be in the same basis state. Um, it turns out that you can, if you work through the math, I'm sorry, I don't have a more intuitive explanation than that, um, that you can reconstruct uh, these statistics, at least the expectation values, um, by preparing and measuring uh, superposition states of the, the basis states that are involved. Hope that hope that at least starts to answer the question. Cool. Um, so we can get even a little bit more concrete. We have the summation. Uh, we can think about now how this looks in terms of circuits that we'd actually design and run on a quantum computer. So we have some state psi. Uh, we'll pictorially represent it like this. We have uh, two orbs representing the two halves of the system that will map onto registers and. Uh, We'll label these with up and down arrows, kind of foreshadowing that we'll be thinking about uh, chemical systems where each register will represent either spin up or spin down uh, orbitals in which electrons can, can reside. And then, of course, purple throughout the talk will uh, try to represent entanglement. Um, so if we're writing this as a circuit, you know, this is the same kind of circuit we had before, entangling operation, and then further 
further gates to structure uh, the local or, or generate the local structure of um, uh, the state. We can do our Schmidt decomposition uh, or singular value decomposition and write this as a sum over basis states weighted by these Schmidt coefficients. Um, and then uh, each of these initial states gets acted on by this, these gates U and V. Um, sorry for if there's a little background noise here. It's a siren going by. Um, all right, so we need to, we said before we need to prepare these, these basis states and all these superposition states uh, to get our expectation value. So that same equation from the previous slide, now written out in terms of uh, single register circuits looks like this. Uh, we can organize all the terms in the sum in this matrix. On the diagonal of the matrix, we're initializing the basis states, B1, B2, and so on, applying the unitaries U and V, and then measuring the relevant operators. Um, on the diagonal, or, or on the off diagonals, we have uh, elements that are representing the cross, the effect of the cross terms, or really the effect of the entanglement between the registers. Um, these have, where we're preparing these superposition states, B1 plus B2 or B1 minus B2. And then they're, they're weighted by the associated Schmidt coefficients out front. So this is just uh, summing over this matrix element-wise to get the result. So an immediate uh, concern is that this looks like it's going to be very expensive. So we have you know, some n qubits in each register. We're going to have something like 2 to the 2n plus 1 uh, unique circuits to run. So that's scaling exponentially, which is generally very bad. Um, as far as you know, wanting to scale this up. Uh, however, the it, it can still be practical provided we have sufficiently weak entanglement. Uh, so again, weak entanglement. If we have some state psi and we do the Schmidt decomposition, it means that these Schmidt coefficients are are rapidly getting smaller and smaller, and, and that really the first uh, the first terms of the really dominate the wave function. Um, so provided that's uh, that's the case, we can uh, somewhat efficiently run this by uh, noting, okay, the first term is really the one that's going to be, that's going to dominate the wave function. When we're doing the summation, we're, we have some number of samples uh, we can take on our quantum computer. We should focus most of those measurements on the important term in the summation. So really the one that's weighted by lambda one squared, uh, since these other terms are going to quickly drop off and just be small contributions. So we shouldn't waste a lot of time measuring those terms very pre super precisely. Um, if we allocate our samples in this way, proportionally to the associated coefficient out front, this lambda n, lambda n in each term in the sum, uh, and you can work through uh, you know, how many samples you'd need to obtain the same uh, precision on your, on your expect estimate of the expectation value compared to not using this entanglement forging scheme. And you see that there's a multiplicative overhead that essentially goes as, as uh, the sum of the Schmidt coefficients to the fourth. So again, if it's if it's very weakly entangled, that limiting case, this first term is one, all the other terms are zero. So this summation just goes to one and we recover just one over epsilon squared. Uh, so there's uh, essentially back to the case without entanglement forging. Um, of course, uh, the other extreme, the worst case scenario, if they're uh, maximally entangled, each of these terms is one over square root of two to the n, there are uh, two to the n of them. And so we have something related, you know, some power of two to the n uh, up top. So that'll go exponentially, and, and of course, that'll be bad. And that, that's not surprising. If we have uh, strong quantum correlations, uh, it's not surprising that that would be uh, exponentially expensive to, to simulate classically. Um, but, but as we have weaker entanglement, if we can focus on problems where there is where there are uh, weakly entangled states of interest, we, we should be able to get by with, with far fewer samples. A much shorter one time. Is there, yes. if I can uh, ask a mm -hmm. quick question, uh, say like an error line or like where you decide it's, it's like, oh no, this is, if we ignore this Schmidt value, no, we our, our answer is going to be nonsense. Like, how do you make that decision? I think, I think it's, uh, I, I don't think I have a real clear, satisfying answer for you. Oh, that's um, I'd say, I'd say hopefully this gives this gives you a technique where you are applying classical resources in a way that is making efficient use of what's available, um, sort of regardless of circumstance. Um, exact saying exactly where the line gets drawn, I, I 
I think at the at the moment, I would just say that the, I'd sort of punt and just say that uh, you probably have to evaluate that on a case by case basis. That's fair. But it is you're hitting on a, a good uh, important point there, definitely. Um, so yeah, so we can talk a little bit more about some details of scalability. So I was just talking about the number of samples you need to run on the quantum computer. Um, if it's maximally entangled, it's going to be exponential. So you want to weak, limit yourself to weakly entangled states, and that's going to govern really the, how many samples you need to run on the on the the back end, on the quantum back end, and so how much sort of runtime that's going to take. Um, you can also ask questions about the scalability of some of the classical processing that that surrounds this. Um, so we have this set of classical parameters, the Schmidt coefficients that define the entangled state or define the entanglement. Um, now the length of, you know, the number of basis states in this decomposition will also grow exponentially. Um, so initially you might think, okay, this is just like a list, 1D list of real numbers. Maybe, maybe it's not something to worry about, but you know, if you do have order 50 qubits or something that quickly grows to be a, a sort of problematically large number of bits um, to, to, to think about. Um, so, you know, you also have to be able to, to work with this distribution so that you can uh, allocate your samples optimally to the set of circuits that are involved in the summation. Um, so, you know, the, there are a few, you know, may, maybe for small problems, it's not an issue. Um, maybe in larger problems, uh, as it starts to become an issue, you might have to do something. You may have to sort of uh, fi find a way to, to limit yourself to a tractable number of bit strings or, or, or terms in the Schmidt decomposition. Um, there are, I think that is sort of an interesting question of uh, if there are other ways to do this, like if you can um, maybe use some of the original circuit, this original part part of this original e unitary to uh, efficiently generate this, this set of samples and kind of avoid some of this classical processing on, on the, on the uh, sample generation side or problem generation side. But um, I don't have anything definitive to say on that today. Um, and uh, additionally, you also so that's that's sort of on the input side of the problem. On the output, you also have to be able to perform this this weighted sum um, sum over all the terms in this matrix. Once you have the data, uh, I, I think that this you know, which also looks like it's going to grow exponentially. Um, I think that one's probably okay. Is that and that we can replace this summation over um, over all the bit strings by really over all the all the samples that you've taken. Um, which presumably can't grow exponentially, given that you've been able to acquire the samples within, you know, whatever constraint it is, the lifetime of the universe or something. Um, so I think that keeps the, the some of the, can 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 help uh, with the classic scaling of the classical processing in that case. If you just sum directly over the samples taken, um, but clearly scalability is something that's uh, you know central to this and and something that's uh, yeah. Well, uh, uh, an interesting thing to keep thinking about. Um, there was a, another quick question from the audience, uh, again from Harshdeep. Uh, to be sure, we need weakly entangled states. So, will it also help a decrease in circuit depth as we need weakly entangled states? Uh, so, the decrease in circuit, there's definitely a beneficial decrease in circuit depth. Um, and I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in a few slides. Um, uh, I'm I'm not sure be, uh, beyond that what exactly the question um, was referring to with with the weakly entangled states specifically. Um, as far as the reduction in circuit depth, yeah, if you if you don't need to run this first part of the circuit that uh, constructs the entanglement and defines the Schmidt coefficients uh, between between the registers, that will that will save you some. Uh, you know, error prone gate operations on the processor. I, I hope that this uh, somewhat answers the question at least. Okay, so changing gears now a little bit, um, if, if there are no other questions at the moment, um, from talking about entanglement and, and entanglement forging uh, to thinking about applying sort of conventional VQE without entanglement forging uh, to a simulation of the water molecule. So, molecules. Um, so we're interested in uh, solving or, or finding uh, the ground state energy of a uh, molecule, specifically thinking, looking at the electronic, uh, electronic structure of this molecule. Um, so this is sort of a, a, an attractive problem for entanglement forging in that in many ground states, the spin up and spin down orbitals 
uh, defining the electronic structure uh, can be weakly entangled. So um, here are some, some Schmidt coefficient, leading Schmidt coefficients uh, in, uh, for a few molecules. Uh, we'll be focusing today on, on the water molecule. We see that this is on a log scale. We see there is some, some drop off. Uh, there's some, some variation across molecules. So again, this will sort of be need to be dealt with on a, a case by case basis um, to see how, how effective these techniques or how efficiently this, this uh, entanglement forging can be applied. Um, but it, it seems promising that a lot of these uh, ground states are largely dominated by the uh, sort of the, the first term in their Schmidt decomposition, which uh, you know, if you have just a single uh, term that corresponds to just having a single Slater determinant, uh, which I believe corresponds to the, the Hartree-Fock uh, approximation to the wave function, kind of the, the classical mean field result, um, or, or the mean field result. Uh, and as we add, include more uh, Schmidt, Schmidt, uh, Schmidt coefficients in our description of the wave function, that's equivalent to adding, including more Slater determinants uh, in, our, in our expansion. Um, so uh, in this work, we'll be focusing on uh, demoing entanglement forging and uh, simulation of the water molecule. Uh, so a bit about the, the model of the water molecule we'll be using. Um, so two hydrogens and an oxygen give us 10 electrons. We'll be describing the system using a standard basis set known as STO6G. Um, we'll, within this, we'll include the first uh, seven molecular orbitals uh, since there's uh, uh, 14 spin orbitals. Um, from these, we'll assume we'll freeze two of them, assuming they're always occupied. So these are uh, the core, orbi core orbital of the oxygen atom and uh, the um, and an out-of-plane orbital that doesn't uh, significantly participate in the bonding. So that leaves us with a total of five molecular orbitals uh, shown here. Uh, each of these has a spin-up and a spin-down version, so we have 10 spin orbitals uh, which is going to give us a, a 10 uh, qubit problem when we apply it in the variational quantum eigensolver. So a quick background in that. The goal of this quantum algorithm is to uh, obtain the ground state energy of a molecular model. So we'll use uh, standard mapping, in this case the Jordan-Wigner mapping, to translate our fermionic problem described in terms of electrons and orbitals into a problem described in terms of qubits and uh, poly operators on those qubits. One spin orbital maps to one qubit, uh, so we have a 10 qubit problem. And now VQE, uh, in, in VQE we use the variational principle, search for the lowest ground state, so we have this back and forth between uh, the classical processor and the quantum processor, where we're preparing some, pro some trial state on the quantum processor, measuring uh, these operators that we need for, to compute our Hamiltonian on, on the processor, sending those results back to the classical processor, which uh, uses them to compute the energy, and then update some uh, parameters that, uh, def that allow us to define and update our uh, trial wave function. And so by iterating on this and trying to minimize the energy, we hopefully obtain, uh, you know, use the, vary these parameters, explore Hilbert space, and uh, find the, the ground state and the ground state energy. Um, so for this demo, we'll be focusing on uh, using classical simulations first to find kind of a, a tailored onsets that works well with conventional VQE without entanglement forging, and then see if we can uh, basically switch on entanglement forging um, and uh, obtain good results running VQE. Um, so again, without entanglement forging, we'll be starting with uh, an uh, onsat circuit that has kind of a, a macro structure that looks something like this. So we have two registers, one for the spin up orbitals, one for the spin down orbitals. We'll apply some X gates on these to uh, indicate that those orbitals are occupied by electrons. Um, then we have some set of gates in this unitary, e, I'm calling it E tilde here, um, that's going to def effectively uh, define the Schmidt coefficient, structure the entanglement, which um, is then realized through these series of CNOTs that copy the state from the first register onto the second register, so generating that initial entanglement. Um, then finally, we'll have uh, additional gates, uh, U here, that are sort of our local operations, locally structure the state. Um, because we have some symmetry uh, within the um, 
uh, symmetry between the spin up and spin down cases, uh, we will uh, and so, will say that the the so both registers experience the same unitary. So instead of u and v, we'll just have we'll just have u. Um, so we'll construct these unit these uh, unitaries with this building block here that we're calling a hop gate. So it's a two qubit entangling gate. It has some nice properties for chemistry. Um, the matrix, uh, its operation is shown here as, as a matrix. Um, it conserves particle number and it maps real. So if we start with 10 electrons, you know, we better end with 10 electrons. Um, it maps real states to real states. It's um, universal. If we have enough of these building blocks, we can construct any uh, real unitary within this uh, fixed particle number subspace. Um, and you can implement it using uh, C naught gates. So um, in this case, we're implementing it with a classical swap followed by two C naughts. Um, so we'll be using this building block to, uh, to sort of fill in the details of that macro structure we looked at on the last slide. Uh, so here this is. This is using, this is the result of just doing a, a simple empirical search uh, using classical, a classical simulator uh, to find a good choice of, of gates that seems to work well for these uh, unitaries E and U. Um, we have a series of hop gates here. The, the frozen orbitals are grayed out as they won't be included in the simulation. Um, and uh, the gates are parameterized by these angles, theta, zero, one, two, and so on. Okay, and so running this on the classical simulator. Sorry to interrupt mm -hmm. again, Andrew. A couple more questions from the audience. Uh, Arsteep asking, have you also applied the qubit tapering Z2 method to reduce the number of qubits further? I, I'm not certain. Um, and there are quantum chemist experts, chemistry experts on our on, on this project. I'm unfortunately, probably the least uh, the, the least familiar of those. Um, so I think I don't know the answer to that question offhand. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I, I don't have that detail uh, at my fingertips, but maybe oh, I can uh, that's entirely try, fair. To, try to follow up afterwards in some capacity. Uh, their second question was, and can you just repeat which orbitals you froze slash removed? Yeah, uh, so the um, the core uh, correspond to the core oxygen orbital. So that that one we removed because it's um, you know it's at a, at a much lower energy than all the other orbitals, uh, and that that cause that leads to it not uh, not participating. There's a very low chance of actually exciting an electron out of that. You know, uh, subterranean energy level up to something relevant, or, or up to one of the other uh, orbitals. Um, that would take a lot of energy, so it, it's not doesn't really happen in this in this model. Um, and then the second orbital um, is one that, um, was, I, you know, the generally the, the choice of freezing orbitals is is I guess a bit a bit subtle, so I don't want to say anything that's too too simplistic. Um, but I understand it as this orbital is um, has kind of an odd symmetry about the molecular plane, whereas all the other, it's a, I guess it's a, a PZ orbital or something to that effect. Um, so it has an odd symmetry about the molecular plane. All the other orbitals have an even symmetry. And um, that at least suggests that it might not participate in the bonding. And, and empirically from you know, running these classical simulations, it, it doesn't seem to contribute significantly. So those are the two orbitals we left out. Or, or froze. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's the the details of this ansatz uh, with before implying entanglement forging. Uh, so if we run this over a range of molecular geometries, uh, we can see uh, fairly good accuracy. So here is uh, the water molecule, and we're uh, as we go horizontally across this axis, we're pulling these hydrogen atoms uh, symmetrically away. From the oxygen, so breaking both of the bonds, um, and we see a fairly good agreement between the prediction of uh, this this classical simulation that or this ansatz uh, fed into VQ optimized by a VQE, uh, the red uh, stars here uh, compared to the uh, the exact calculation or FCI energy that you get from essentially numerical diagonalization of our of our model. So that's these uh, black crosses. Um, so 
you know, it seems like a promising onsets, but you know, one one challenge would be if you wanted to actually run this on a device, um, it would uh, have to contend with the limitations of device connectivity. So, you know, for example, here's a, a coupling map showing the connectivity of physical qubits on a, a Fal IBM Falcon processor. Um, I'm not really worried about the, the color scale here, just about the, the topology and connectivity. So which qubits are, are joined to which other qubits. Um, if we have some two in qubit circuit with you know, five, uh, 10 qubits, uh, one register spin up, one register spin down, it's, it ends up being somewhat expensive uh, to implement this, um, this uh, entangling operation generally. So I just took this, this set of gates and fed it into Qiskit and, and, uh, and just just for a demo, this demo, this slide, um, and asked it to transpile it at optimization level three, and uh, you know got this out. So this this has quite a few. Um, if you look at closely, there are these all these triplets of C knots going in opposite di opposite directions, and 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 these realize swaps. Um, and essentially, there's a lot of shuttling of information that has to happen to realize all the connections between physically distant qubits on the chip uh, to entangle these two registers. Um, so in this case, it looks like you need roughly 10 swaps or, you know, comes to about 30 C knots in order to do this entangling step. Um, so a nice thing about entanglement forging is, is uh, not only do you have fewer qubits, you also have easier circuits. You can kind of skip this part of the circuit and not, uh, not, not worry about accumulating errors during running all these C knots and uh, especially, um, you know, in, in, in uh, circumstances where you have limited device connectivity. Okay, so um, finally, we'll now turn to the actual experiment. So we're combining these two elements, the entanglement forging and the VQE simulation of the water molecule. Um, uh, quick question with mm -hmm. respect to that simulation. Mm -hmm. uh, someone's asking, in your simulation, did you consider effect of noise? This is, an, this is a noiseless uh, simulation. So if, um, so it's not worrying about anything. It's just, it's just asking, you know, does, we're going to change this onsets structure a bit when we go to entanglement forging. You know, we'll we'll tear out this first half and replace it with classical processing effectively. Um, so the noise is going to be the errors you accumulate are going to be quite different. Um, so in this case, we're just running uh, just a classical simulation to see you know if if everything's going going well, if entanglement forging is working properly. You know, what what kind of performance could we hope to get? Um, so this is very much the ideal case simulation. No no noise here. Right, so now we're now we're switching on entanglement forging. So before we had our uh, state, we we're doing the standard uh, Jordan Wigner mapping, getting a 10 qubit circuit, measuring uh, operators to reconstruct the Hamiltonian, getting out the energy versus uh, molecular geometry. So entanglement forging is giving us this this other path, expanding this in terms of the Schmidt decomposition. Um, and then measure, expanding this again in term, uh, to measure the desired two register operator in terms of one register operators, measuring all of this, measuring all of these circuits, combining them, and we should be able to obtain a similar performance. And in the ideal case, you should get the exact, exactly the same result out. Um, so there's a trade-off where we have easier quantum circuits, but you know, we have more unique circuits, and moreover, we have a larger number of total samples we need to take to obtain the same precision. Uh, zooming into the, one of these circuits, just to try to keep this concrete, um, we can look at what each of these circuits in this summation uh, looks like. So again, we have our five orbitals, mapping them onto five qubits. We'll be uh, following entanglement forging's uh, procedure. We'll be preparing either the, the basis uh, states, so these essentially elect electronic configuration states where you have a, a definite occupation of uh, electrons in each orbital uh, or, or across the orbitals um, are all superpositions of, of pairs of these states. So, you know, bit strings or, or sums of them. And in this case shown here, for example, we have uh, an initialization circuit that uh, is preparing a superposition of uh, the first three orbitals being occupied and this and the last two empty along with uh, the bit string where you've or the, the, the configuration where you've promoted one electron from the the lowest orbital in our active space 
up to the highest orbital in that active space. Uh, to all these uh, initial states, we're applying our set of hop gates um, to structure the, the states locally within the registers. And then we're measuring all the uh, poly operators that we need to reconstruct the Hamiltonian. And uh, I'm, I'm mostly leaving the poly operators out of this talk for simplicity. They kind of add another dimension that's that for the most part we don't need to, to worry about here. Um, I'll briefly mention that you know, our original Hamiltonian has before forging has uh, something like 500 uh, 10 qubit poly strings. So it's, it is uh, a big problem that has a lot of circuits in it. Okay. So, right, we're running, uh, running all of these circuits, taking those results from the quantum processor, feeding them to the classical processor. The processor is doing this uh, double sum over the different terms in this, in this summation that are expanded in terms of these uh, basis states in the Schmidt decomposition. Um, taking those five qubit expectation values, combining them with the Schmidt coefficients, and uh, recovering the 10 qubit expectation value of interest. So the classical processor is, is correlating these, these uh, provide, uh, doing the processing to, to reconstruct the correlate, quantum correlations between the subsystems. Um, there's nothing uh, that limits this to being applied to VQE, um, but uh, within VQE, these are going to be, you know, uh, these can be classical parameters uh, that get updated. Um, and in this demo, um, for simplicity, we're, we're truncating this to the leading uh, three Schmidt coefficients in our expansion. So that's going to give us three, three extra parameters. Um, or, excuse me, it'll give us, well, there's also a normalization condition there. But, um, right, so that we can think about details of how we want to update these Schmidt coefficients, uh, lambda sub n, in our trial wave function as VQE is, is iterating. Um, so how was this, for reference, you know, how was this done in our original onsets? Well, we had these three gates initially that uh, were parameterized by theta zero, theta one, theta two, and these structured the entanglement before this, this ladder of C naughts uh, copied it over, copied over the state. Um, so these implicitly were defining uh, the Schmidt coefficients, and those angles were varied by the optimizer uh, as usual as VQA, VQE was, was iterating back and forth. Um, in the case of forging, we have a couple of options. Uh, one is that we could uh, take our optimizer and just let it vary the uh, lambdas directly as parameters. And so in addition to the thetas that are in, in sort of the U part of the circuit here. Um, and, and we'll probably also want the, to constrain this in some way to, to stay in a, a, a weakly entangled part of Hilbert space. Um, hopefully we can, we can stay on kind of the safe path within Hilbert space of, of Starting in some weakly entangled state, and then and then finding a weakly entangled ground state without without veering into the more difficult terrain of uh, of, of more strongly entangled states. Um, option two, uh, if if classical processing permits, you know, in this problem, it's it's we've only have a few Schmidt coefficients. Um, you know, we can observe. Actually, we don't need to specify. There's nothing to saying saying that we really have to specify the Schmidt coefficients prior to execution of the set of circuits of interest. Um, we can, so so if we have our measurement results in hand for all of these circuits, uh, that allows us to build a matrix of these results, which you can diagonalize, um, and that will give you the, the Schmidt coefficients that minimize the uh, expectation value of the energy uh, given those measurement results. So um, that lets, that, that extra bit of uh, classical processing Let's you uh, drop a few very drop the Schmidt coefficients as variational parameters and just update them uh, numerically to their numerically optimal values uh, each iteration, provided you can you can pay for that processing cost. Um, another sort of interesting technical trick that that entanglement forging led us to kind of stumble on um, comes from combining a couple of op op observations here. So, as you mentioned before. Um, and these ground states, the Hartree factor and this leading uh, Schmidt coefficient typically dominates. Um, and since we're, we need to allocate shots based on the size of the Schmidt coefficients, that means that that term is also the most expensive to evaluate, um, that, that first uh, term in the summation, because it has lambda 1 squared, which is much bigger than all other combinations of lambda m times lambda n for some m and n. Um, this, this sort of more or less came out of left field, but um, I, I guess sort of coincidentally, or, or perhaps not, um, 
our on, the onsets that we found through our empirical search uh, leaves this initial Hartree Fox state untouched. So if you um, initialize the Hartree Fox state, so this bit string where you uh, say the lowest three orbitals are occupied and the, the higher two are unoccupied. And then you apply this set of unitary gates that we've, we've decided to use. Um, two of the gates give you minus signs, but don't move any electrons. And the other three gates don't do anything. Uh, the two minus signs cancel out, and this circuit just reduces to preparing that Hartree Fox state and measuring it. Um, that means that this circuit is, is invariant or, or, or doesn't depend on the parameters of your gates. So in some sense, there's no need to reevaluate this each iteration of VQE, um, which is kind of a kind of an interesting thing. Um, at least I, I find it kind of interesting, um, and that it, it's saying that the quantum it's kind of let, lets the quantum processor focus on the more quantum part of the problem. Um, Hartree Fock is easily accessible classically, um, so you can compute that even just classically, or else just once on the quantum computer, uh, and then not waste any more time. Uh, recomputing this classical mean field component, really taking the mean field part out of the quantum processor's workload uh, and just having it focus on the, the energy contribution and the quantum correlations. And in this case, you know, we only have three bit strings, so this is really a, a dominant part of the problem that lets you, um, removing this, this term in the summation or the need to measure these circuits, gives you something like a 10x speed up in, uh, in the overall uh, problem time. Um, so I think that's sort of an open question of how, how generally um, you can find these sorts of uh, optimizations of within cir general circuit cutting methods of uh, sort of identifying and isolating the more classical parts of the problem and, and removing those from the, the workload of the, the quantum processor in order to speed up computations. Um, wasn't really the focus of, the, of this project, but uh, sort of an interesting observation, I think. Okay, so finally we're loading, we have our set of circuits we'd like to run. We're loading them onto the quantum hardware. We're gonna run, we ran them on the IBM Dublin processor. It's a 27 qubit Falcon chip um, shown, uh, shown schematically here. We have a large number of circuits, so we'd like to run them quickly. We'll use um, active qubit reset. That's now standard on devices uh, on IBM backends uh, to give us a 10 kilohertz repetition rate. Um, Additionally, to increase throughput a bit further, we'll take our two instances of our five qubit problem. So for example, maybe on this side of the chip, we'll be uh, looking at what happens when you symmetrically stretch the molecule. And on this side, we could be varying the bond angle uh, and run those simultaneously such that we have uh, a 20,000 five qubit circuit uh, throughput per second. Um, and finally, we'll do standard uh, mitigation techniques like uh, measurement error mitigation and also a simple version of zero noise extrapolation um, to, to push the error rates uh, down further from these uh, initial values. Um, a little bit on zero noise extrapolation. This is uh, not uh, terribly profound once, once you understand it, I guess, but. Um, just uh, taking, uh, we'll run to try to estimate the effect of um, the effect of gate errors and correct for that. We'll run two versions of each circuit, one where we have the circuit consisting of all its original gates, G, um, and a second version of each circuit where each gate, G, has been replaced by a series of three gates, G, G inverse G, uh, to, to roughly estimate the effect of, of increasing the error rate by a factor of three. Uh, this is this is uh, kind of a rough approximation, but it seems to work um, to, to to certainly improve the accuracy of the results uh, compared to just running uh, the original circuit. Um, there's this is these and similar techniques have been explored uh, quite a bit in the literature. Um, here's some example res example results showing uh, showing the effect here. So the original circuit without any extrapolation or, or gate mitigation, gate error mitigation is, is uh, shown in gray here. This is the energy as a function of, of VQE iteration, in this case, something in the order of 12 hours. Um, and then if we do this extrapolation back to, to try to estimate the, the result, if there were no errors, uh, we obtain the, the dark blue and light blue circles. And uh, for comparison, we can, um, we also are showing here what happened, what would happen if you ran 
the same circuits uh, with on, on a noiseless simulator in pink. And uh, you can see the agreement is, is significantly improved in that case. Okay. Um, so finally, some results. So here we're looking at uh, the computed energy of the, of the electronic state of the molecule as a function of, in this case, bond angle, so molecular geometry on the horizontal axis. We have a couple of curves here uh, the, for uh, classically computed reference curves. So the, in red the red dashed curve is the Hartree-Fock energy, so the, the approximate mean field result. The green solid curve is the FCI, so the exact uh, the result from exact diag numerical diagonalization of our model. Um, and the uh, blue dots are the results from running entanglement forging with three bit strings on Dublin. Um, the residuals are shown in the lower plot between the results from Dublin and the FCI. Uh, we see a uh, fairly good accuracy on the order of one to 10 millihartree, which seems consistent, which is consistent with the picture that um, this problem is, uh, th this set of geometries is uh, consists of weakly entangled states, which makes it somewhat easier for entanglement forging to, uh, to run. And we can see that in a little more detail. If we look at the entanglement structure of the converged wave function, uh, in this case, we have access to the Schmidt coefficients, so we can just plot them uh, as a function, again, of molecular geometry here. And we see that uh, in all of these cases, there is one Schmidt coefficient that clearly dominates with the other two uh, just making small corrections on top of that. So that's sort of a, a, a easier problem for entanglement forging to, uh, to simulate. In contrast, we can look at uh, what, ha what happens when we, rather than changing the bond angle, pull both of these uh, hydrogens away from the oxygen symmetrically. So this uh, symmetric bond radius is plotted on the horizontal axis. Um, again, the blue dots are showing the result from the hardware, with the green showing the exact curve. You can see uh, down here, looking at the blue dots, that the residuals uh, you know, near equilibrium, where it's essentially running some of the same problems that are on the previous slide. Uh, near equilibrium, uh, the discrepancy is, is fairly good on the order of 1 to 10 millihartree. As we, um, as we pull the two hydrogens away, the discrepancy goes up to order 100 millihartree. Um, we can ask, why is that happening? One question, one first question is maybe it's due to some noise effect on the uh, quantum processor that's limiting us. Um, so we can run the same, to control for that, we can run uh, the same problem on our noiseless simulator, just a classical simulation uh, with the same onsets, and uh, see that that also has this increase in the residuals as we go into this uh, highly stretched regime. Um, we can understand this by, again, looking at the entanglement structure that we obtain from, uh, from the converged VQE runs. We see that as we stretch the molecule, we're actually getting into a more strongly entangled regime where all of, these, uh, where all of the Schmidt coefficients now are, are becoming significant, and it's becoming more difficult to uh, describe the behavior using entanglement forging. Um, and so uh, from that, you know, you, it, that motivates uh, running. In this case, we just ran another uh, noiseless simulation, but including a few more bit strings or a few more Schmidt coefficients in our, our description. Um, and that uh, reduced the residuals uh, significantly, even in this highly, highly stretched regime. Um, so as we include more, as we're able to include more uh, Schmidt coefficients in our description of the, of the molecule, we'll uh, have a, a, a more uh, expressivity to describe strong, more strongly entangled states. Um, and finally, uh, we also ran the case of just pulling away a single hydrogen to see what happens. Um, Again, good accuracy near, uh, or, or better accuracy near equilibrium where the entanglement is, is weaker. Um, as we go to uh, highly, uh, highly stretched states, we're getting into a regime where, um, well, looking at the entanglement structure, we see that there are two significant Schmidt coefficients. Um, that seems at least consistent with the idea that you're dissociating into uh, uh, an OH and an H fragment. Um, or fragments that are uh, an H and OH, um, and perhaps the, the picture of having two dominant uh, terms or configurations um, matches with the idea of having uh, either a spin up or spin down electron on the, that single uh, dissociated hydrogen. Well, so that's um, 
about the end of my talk, just as a quick rehash. Um, so we discussed uh, this idea of classically forged entanglement um, using a hybrid quantum classical representation to simulate a 2n qubit system using only n physical qubits, um, provided you can afford the classical processing and, then the, and provided the state is uh, not too strongly entangled. Um, you, don't, you can uh, run this without a, without a fundamental loss of accuracy in your description of the wave function, uh, more efficient for weakly, more weakly entangled states, and, and it's not limited to just BQE. So we're hoping to find applications of this in uh, other contexts as well. Um, we discussed, uh, showed the results for this water simulation um, using five qubits to simulate 10 spin orbitals. Saw accuracy on the order of one to 10 millihartree over a, a broad range of molecular geometries. Um, and again, demonstrated how as you add more of these uh, Schmidt coefficients in your description, uh, you're, you're able to describe more strongly entangled states. Um, so going forward, we hope to build on this, uh, keep learning uh, how best to apply our classical resources to extend the reach of quantum, quantum processors, um, make this more accessible through some form of uh, standardization uh, and implementation in Qiskit, um, maybe exploring the randomized sampling of circuits in some, some fashion to uh, hopefully improve classical processing when setting up the problem. Um, there's an additional uh, extension of this method that was that's discussed in a supplement of our of the paper on the archive, uh, which we're referring to as, as Heisenberg forging or, or entanglement forging in the Heisenberg picture. Um, haven't gotten into that at all today, but uh, it's it seems like that may be promising to generalize this to um, to, uh, to applications in in some uh, more strong even more strongly entangled states, um, and also of course looking for use ca use cases beyond. Uh, the, just VQB. So yeah, thank you for uh, sticking around and I'm happy to uh, take any questions. Thank you for thank that, Andrew. Uh, very interesting talk. Uh, I feel like I learned a lot, but ended up you know, realizing I still need to learn a lot more on the, the relevant topics uh, on top of that. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, that's, that's my situation too. So <laughs> sounds like sounds like it got through. It's a uh, wonderful world of research. You get to learn more about what you, how much you don't know still. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, no, but this is uh, a lot of fun, and I, I uh, this project was a lot of fun. I, I got to learn a whole lot of new stuff, and uh, it's been great working with the other uh, other members of the team and sort of getting to draw on their expertise and. Uh, all sorts of topics from quantum algorithms to quantum chemistry. Um, so, yeah, learned a lot too. But there's, there's always more to more to more to learn. Uh, there was uh, one quick question from the audience. Uh, a couple now. Uh, first one. Uh, one of your slides had the twelve hours on the x-axis. They they were just asking, is that for the full experiment or one run? What's that time referring to? Yeah, that's uh, for one. Uh, I think that's rough. I think we might have gotten that time a little bit lower later on, but I think it's roughly right. Um, how long it took to, con to converge uh, for VQE to converge um, for one molecular geometry. And this okay. was all run over, I didn't mention this anyway, this is all run through Qiskit over the, the IBM cloud, so through the internet. Um, so there's there's some additional processing there um, that I don't think it was the the bottleneck. I think mostly we just needed to run lots and lot take lots and lots of samples, um, but uh, and we had lots of poly terms to measure and so on um, that that also you know, led to needing a lot of shots. Um, but uh, yeah, this this probably could be sped up somewhat with both with sort of backend improvements that have just happened uh, since we ran this experiment a, a few months back, um, and also with the, the sort of advent of, of Qiskit runtime, I imagine could cut down appreciably on some of the some of the processing and communication time when running over the cloud. So that's where you just uh, I haven't really used it yet, but I'm looking forward to using it in the near future. Uh, the idea is you you write your program and instead of sending every job back and forth over the network, you 
write your program that generates jobs and send that over the network and then they run that locally so they don't have to send these big lists of circuits back and forth. I'm, I'm carried, distract, carried away talking about runtime, so I'm not sure. Oh, I no, question, no, I, that was, that was uh, I will assume that question did was answered from that. Uh, one of the other questions of how does the precision of SVD impact the results? Um, so definitely there are these, uh, you know, if, if you don't include enough terms in your, uh, in your Schmidt decomposition or your, your singular value decomposition, um, then you'll be limited as, as to how strong of an entangled state you can describe. Um, or, or, yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, so, you know, we're we're not really running SVD numerically at any at any point in this uh, in this operation. We just have this list. I mean, maybe in some sense we are, and that we're we're obtaining these these Schmidt coefficients. But um, you know, we're we're getting we're getting this list of of Schmidt coefficients or or singular values from from the the measurement from the measurement results of, of these circuits um so uh, the, the and, and the precision of those those measurements as far as getting the expectation value is is again going to um you know that it'll it'll be more costly get to get a precise measurement of the expectation value using entanglement forging when you have a strong more strongly entangled state and that that scales is something like the um that that's that is predicted to scale like the fourth power of the sum of Schmidt coefficients. So, um, I don't know that I answered a slightly different question than you asked, but hopefully that is the relevant information. Uh, there was a quick follow up on the timing question: is uh, if you happen to know what percentage of the run was spent in the uh, classical optimizer? Uh, not much. Uh, we we only have we have very few parameters in this sort of you know initial demonstration problem right so it's it doesn't take long to to update those parameters um, at least yeah it, there was a little more processing time for generating the list of circuits um, honestly I probably could have cut that down if I just read the documentation on like generating parameterized circuits instead of regenerating the whole list of circuits each time but. Um, anyway, most of the time was was actually taking samples and maybe with some non negligible but not dominant contribution from the classical like communication and loading time of load sending the circuits to the back end and loading them onto the back end. Um, the rest of the, the rest of the computations at this scale were were not too bad. Um, clearly, though, as you you know, as you go to larger problems with and, and include larger numbers of, uh, of of terms in your Schmidt decomposition, the you know that'll that'll get more challenging. It'll, it'll quickly get more challenging. Yeah. But but I think uh, there are, I think there are paths to uh, to over to overcoming that and doing that in a way that's either either scalable or or at least can give you a good heuristic uh, approximation to uh, to to in cases where the entanglement's too strong to, uh, to to let it be scalable. I uh, would, as you were showing with the residuals at some point, once those get too high, that's kind of showing that increase in that entanglement. Can that be kind of used as a way to just kind of in situ check? Oh, if you're, if you're going into it not knowing, oh, it's the entanglement too much or anything like that. Uh, yeah, I think, I think it's, this is, this is a question that, that it's definitely kind of subtle. Um, and maybe I can, I can address it, um, or address it adequately. Uh, I'll try anyway. I mean, it's, it's kind of this, in some sense, you know, if it, we're, we're inheriting this problem from, from the original sort of structure of VQE, where we need to decide how many gates and uh, parameterized gates we're going to include in our circuit to to structure the entanglement in the first place you know, as we include more gates here that's uh you know somewhat equivalent at some level to uh including more schmidt coefficients in our um 
in our ansatz. So at least it's not an entirely new problem and that um, it, it, or, or not a problem that's in, entirely just being introduced by sort of turning on entanglement forging. Um, we're, we're, we're sort of just making it more explicit, I think. Um, but so, so I don't have a total answer for that, but I'd say probably the same, the same lines of reasoning by which you might grow gate, grow an onsats and adding more gates, uh, and maybe in an adapt VQE type way, um, or, or, or other methods for this, um, and without entanglement forging, maybe some of those ideas can be carried over, uh, to entanglement forging. Um, but I don't have a definite answer on that as far as, you know, how to, how to decide exactly how many Schmidt coefficients to include. The, the problem with using the residuals is you don't know the, you know, th this is, this is all kind of, uh, you know, an, an, a small enough problem that we can compare it to the right answer. But in yeah. principle, you'd like to think about problems, scaling this to problems where you can't compute the right answer in advance. So then you, you can't, uh, look at the residuals and, and see how well you're doing. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was uh, one question, somewhat uh, a more broad question, just like uh, touching on the field itself. Uh, early circuits seem somewhat analogous to assembly for classical computers. Uh, do you think as the number of circuits increases along with the depth that just a high level quantum language can be developed? Um, I know it's, it's a bit of an open question. I, yeah, I think I would say, I like, my inclination is I, I think that's probably the plan, but I, I yeah. don't have enough, I don't have real expertise in that area to, to weigh in on that definitively. Uh, so maybe I'll, uh, maybe I'll just, just defer on that question to someone more qualified and try to avoid spreading more misinformation on YouTube or something. <laughs> That in itself is a good answer. Um, brilliant. Uh, perhaps uh, one final question uh, the, uh, some in the audience was asking, is there ways to uh, contact you for uh, further correspondence? Are you on the uh, Kiskit workspace? Uh, what's, I am uh, on the Kiskit way? workspace. That's, that's, a, that's a good way to, to, to message me. Um, yeah, on the, on the Slack workspace, I assume. Mm -hmm. There's something else I don't know about it. Oh, no. Yes, on the Slack, uh, the Slack Kiskit workspace. Yes, mm -hmm. for any of the audience, uh, there's the link right there. Great. Brilliant. Well, I think uh, I and all the audience, uh, once again, thank Andrew for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation and discussion. I hope uh, everyone's enjoyed it and that uh, if you have any further questions on the uh, paper and uh, the presentation, feel free to reach out in the uh, Kiskit Slack. And besides that, I hope everyone has a good rest of the day and an enjoyable weekend. Sounds good. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>